This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 113 was recorded on April 12, 2018. I'm Eric Townsend. Darius Dale heads up the Macro Research Department for Hedgeye. Darius will join me as this week's feature interview guest when we'll discuss Hedgeye's three principal macro themes for the second quarter. Those three themes are the U.S. growth cycle peaking, global imbalances, and why Hedgeye believes that the U.S. dollar is now in a bottoming process. Darius sent us a fantastic book of graphs and charts that you're definitely going to want to download. You'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email, or if you're not registered yet, just click the red button labeled Looking for the Downloads on our homepage at macrovoices.com. Be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview, when Patrick and I will be back to discuss our interview with Darius, as well as the Hong Kong dollar and several other macro issues. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, over the last two weeks, we've been uh, talking about all of the downside risks of the S&P 500 and the risks that there could still be one more leg lower, yet the S&P 500 seems to have dug in here, neither breaking out on the upside, but we really haven't seen any resumption of heavy selling on the downside. What's your thinking here on the S&P 500? Well, as you say, we've been consolidating for the last week, arguably the last two weeks, at least for the last week or so. The range has been around 2600 to 2625 on the bottom, and 2675 seems to be the resistance at the top. Uh, I guess my question would be, if it were done going down, then why hasn't it gone up more impressively? And I think the reason is that the market is consolidating. I think that there is another leg down still to come. But there's a caveat there, which is what it would take to break the cycle would be some good news. Now, if we were to get a resolution to this Syria geopolitical risk situation and some kind of agreement between President Trump and President Xi in China that resolved this trade war thing, I think that would be enough to cause that upside breakout and we could say, okay, the bottom is in. Unless we get some news event, though, I think that the market is consolidating and will probably resolve that consolidation range to the downside, testing new lows, as we've discussed in past weeks. I would say, though, as you alluded, it's gone on a little longer than I expected in this sideways consolidation. I wasn't expecting this. So either outcome is possible. If I had to bet, though, I'd say I'm leaning a little bit more towards there being more downside here before the bottom is in. Well, let's move on to the dollar index because last week we were just testing the top end of that range and we were debating whether the dollar breakout was going to happen. And uh, since the show, the dollar index uh, suddenly started selling not only below 90, but headed right down toward the bottom end of the 89 handle. We got a little bit of a, a bounce higher. I think we're closing at 89 spot 77 right now. What's your thinking here on the dollar? Well, as you say, we've been from the top of the channel almost down to the bottom of that consolidation range, and now we're bouncing very nicely off of that, uh, most of the way back up towards a 90 handle. We've been in a consolidation range for several weeks between 89 and 90, with occasional dips down to 88.5, occasional pops up to 90.5. But basically, we're trading sideways, so uh, I don't see any indication on the chart that says which way is next. I, I think that we are going to consolidate until we get a break in one direction or the other. I'm still leaning in terms of a short-term resolution to this consolidation towards an upside breakout, but I could see it going either way. I'm definitely bearish in the long term for the U.S. dollar, but as we've discussed several times in recent weeks, uh, I see a lot of reason that there could be a short squeeze or a last hurrah safety trade higher in the dollar before eventually you get into a second decline. So, of course, I could be wrong. It could be that uh, the upside is all done and the secular decline is already on and we're just waiting to break lower and it really accelerates from there. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll sit, wait and see what happens. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil because last week we were talking about that trend line along the bottom with the support around $62 and you were asking whether it was going to hold. And subsequently, you were mentioning the fact that if uh, we got some sort of geopolitical event, it could be a catalyst. And obviously, we've had a big breakout here in crude. What's your thinking? 
Well, I think that's exactly it, as you described. Last week, we were right on the 62 mark, which was a key support level. It looked like it was a setup for a breakdown there. And then, of course, over the weekend, the news broke about Syria. And as soon as the market opened Sunday, the futures started just taking off from there. And by Wednesday, we were right back up at the top of the channel. I think the number that I mentioned last week was that we could get back up to a 67 spot 76 target. So far, we've got gotten up to 67 spot 50 or so. So within a quarter uh, of that target, I won't be surprised if we get there. Uh, I don't think that this is so much all about Syria in the sense of, uh, you know, there's no significant oil production in Syria, even though the geopolitical situation there is obviously very scary. It's not about Syrian oil production. It's about the U.S. conflict with Russia and where that could take us. Obviously, Russia is a major oil producer. So I think that the big upside that we've seen is associated with the Syria situation, but it's really about the U.S. relationship with Russia. Now, Anything is possible in the oil market when a geopolitical upset occurs. I think, though, that we got to these highs based on what seemed, based on the news flow that was available in the first half of the week, like there was not only an imminent invasion of Syria, but, uh, boy, President Trump's tweet, was it uh, Thursday morning or Wednesday afternoon, when uh, he responded to Russia saying, you know, look out, the missiles are coming. At that point, I was really getting worried. I think that we're seeing on Thursday, some pretty considerable toning down of the rhetoric. And uh, it looked almost like there might not be a missile strike. Crude oil was selling off very aggressively Thursday morning, and it was right around the time that news came out that uh, the U.S. is, in fact, going to target eight sites that they are going to hit with missiles, but they're going to inform the Russian military ahead of time as to what the targets are. So it sounds like they're at least working with Russia now to avoid any uh, Russian troop casualties in this military action. So uh, when that news came out, of course, we went back up to the highs of the day, highs of yesterday. We haven't pushed to new highs quite yet. Uh, I think it's really a question of where this goes. If we see an escalation of tension, and particularly if there is any Russian casualties, if Russian soldiers are killed by U.S. missiles, anything could happen to the upside. If that does not occur and we see a de-escalation of this Syria situation, it sounds like a missile attack is imminent, but you know, the, the U.S. is announcing it ahead of time, so it probably is going to be a fairly contained affair at this point. Uh, once that's over, I think maybe we're ready to move back down in oil price because we came rocketing right up to the top of channel resistance and there's some really very critical levels just above the market now. On Brent particularly, just about a dollar above today's close. And it was actually the high print of the day yesterday on Wednesday on Brent. The number to watch on Brent is 73 spot 09. That was Wednesday's high of the day. And that was also the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement of the really big move down from $147 a barrel back in 2008, all the way down to $27 a barrel. So that's a 10 year move. Needless to say, for a move above that, that technical level to be valid. It would probably have to move above that level and stay there for several weeks before that signal would be confirmed. But if that is confirmed, that's a pretty significant long-term bullish signal for oil. I think that it's going to serve as resistance, at least for now. Now, if there's an escalation beyond what's expected right now, anything is possible to the upside. But if what we get is the obligatory missile strike because we said there was going to be one and then it's over and we're de-escalating from there, I think oil prices will probably drift down into next week. Well, Eric, how did the inventories come in on oil? Well, it should have been a very bearish inventory report. Crude oil building 3.3 million barrels against expectations of a small drawdown. Cushing, Oklahoma building 1.1 million barrels. Gasoline building 458,000 barrels. Distillates drawing down 1 million barrels. Production increasing by 65,000 barrels. Now, just to put that number in context, if you were to sustain a 65,000 barrel weekly build every week for a year, you would end up with about three and a half million extra barrels of production at the end of that year. I don't expect this number to be sustained, but we have seen a sustained number of around 25 or 30,000 barrels per week, and that would annualize to about 1.3 to 1.5 million barrels per year of additional production coming online over the next year. So we are seeing very significant increases in production and we're seeing builds in inventory. 
Exports down this week to 1.2 million barrels per day. That works out to about 8.5 million barrels on the week. There were no uh, VLCC, super large tankers, leaving from the Louisiana offshore oil port this week the way there were last week. Question is, was that a one-off deal or was that a new trend that's starting and there are many more to come? Those are really, really big ships. They can carry several million barrels of crude oil. So if we were to see a trend of more more VLCCs being used as crude oil export vessels from the United States, that could really increase our rate of export. And by the way, the Brent WTI spread has been widening rather dramatically, and that only exacerbates the situation. It creates a greater financial incentive for the export of U.S. oil. So overall, this should have been a very, very bearish inventory report overall. The market, of course, knee-jerked down on the news because it was so bearish. That lasted a matter of minutes, Patrick, and the market promptly rallied and moved considerably higher. So clearly, geopolitical tension has the market's attention much more than inventory this week. All right, well, let's move on to gold because I was at the edge of my seat yesterday looking at that breakout to 1370, thinking like, is this it? Are we breaking to an all-time new high heading to 1400? And just like that, a pop and drop, full reversal, we're down at 1337 again. What's, what are you thinking here on gold? Well, Patrick, I think the escalation up to 1370 was entirely about the Russian-U.S. geopolitical tension, and that arose, of course, after President Trump tweeted in response to the Russian ambassador to uh, Beirut, Lebanon, had said any missiles that the U.S. fires into Syria will be shot down, and even the sources, in other words, the Arleigh Burke-class guided missile cruisers, which fire those Tomahawk cruise missiles, could be targeted and sunk by Russia, according to this guy. President Trump saw that tweet, lost his cool, in my opinion, and responded saying, get ready, Russia, because the missiles are coming, and they're nice and shiny and new, and they're coming your way. Frankly, Patrick, what utterly shocked me was the fact that we only got to 1370. I expected a much, much bigger reaction in both oil and gold to begin immediately when the futures session opened on Sunday evening. What we saw for the first few minutes is the move up in oil was muted, and there was actually a move down in the price of gold for the first few minutes on Sunday evening. Now, of course, once those tweets came out, things really escalated, but Frankly, Patrick, I can't remember a time since the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, you've got the two biggest nuclear superpowers in the world. Basically, Russia saying if the U.S. fires missiles into Syria and Russia's contention is that there was no chemical attack, that it was entirely staged, it never happened, and it was uh, completely falsified. If the U.S. responds to that, Russia will shoot down the missiles and maybe even sink the ship that fired them and the president of the united states tweets back and since when is twitter a diplomatic channel anyway tweets back and says get ready vladimir the missiles are coming that was a really scary moment in the history of the world as far as i'm concerned patrick the fact that gold could only get to 1370 and not even make a new high above the uh, highs that we hit of 1375 or so earlier this year that really surprised me and i think it probably portends kind of a bearish picture for gold in my opinion maybe i'm overreacting but i personally saw this week as a really scary time i think things are finally de-escalating as of thursday afternoon the U.S. is still going to attack eight sites in Syria, but they're going to inform the Russian military of what the targets are in advance, giving the Russians time to move out of the way. And at the same time, Russia has de-escalated its rhetoric a little bit, no longer talking about shooting down missiles, but rather just saying that they're going to protect their troops. I think that fortunately, we are now de-escalating away from what to me was a really, really scary situation. So I'm shocked that we only got as far as 1370 on gold. Uh, now that we're back down to 1332, I'm going to be watching 1308, which is the key support. Uh, of course, if there's another escalation of this geopolitical tension, anything could happen. But I'm kind of thinking that if it could only get to 1370 on that news, it's kind of a, a weak signal in my mind. All right, well, let's move on to Treasury yields because uh, over the last few days, we've seen yields coming from uh, being just around the 272 level now to about the 283, almost at 10 basis points higher. Are we going for another little push higher on yields? 
You know, when we have all these geopolitical tensions and everything else, it's hard to tell exactly what signal is interfering with and uh, influencing what other signal. Uh, I'm not too worried at this 282 level, but certainly if we start getting back into the 290s, and particularly if we get over 3% on the 10-year, uh, I really get concerned. You know, what we're seeing is the short squeeze that we thought might be coming is definitely not materializing. So that's uh, certainly a data point to consider in terms of strategy. As far as the fact that we've come back from 272 up to 282 in the last few days, there's so much going on, Patrick, with the geopolitical tension and everything else. You know, I'm not sure what the drivers are. I think we need to wait and see what happens. Now, Eric, the uh, Investor Podcast aired part one of that uh, cryptocurrency battle that you had. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, you know, Tur de Meester is a really good guy, and it's a pleasure to disagree so strongly with a perfect gentleman, where I can at least respect the man if I don't agree with his views. In part one, we mostly focused on blockchain, the enabling distributed ledger technology upon which cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are built. In part two, which is going to air this Saturday evening at eight o'clock on the Investors Podcast, you'll be able to get the actual Bitcoin content, which is probably a little bit more of what people are looking to. So there's a link in your research roundup for part one, which already aired, that's still available at theinvestorspodcast.com. And I believe it's Saturday evening, 8 p.m., that they're planning to release part two. All right. Well, thanks for the summary, Eric. Now, this week's featured interview guest is Darius Dale, Director of Macro Research at Hedgeye. Eric's interview with Darius Dale is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Darius Dale, Director of Macro Research for Hedgeye. Our regular listeners know that Hedgeye always sends us a fantastic book of graphs and charts. I highly recommend that you download it as Darius and I will be referring to it throughout the interview. You'll find the download link in your research roundup email. Our regular listeners are already familiar with the process that Hedgeye uses, but for any new listeners, we've asked Hedgeye to go ahead and send us the full chart book. So the first 15 or so slides are for reference of any new listeners. Darius, why don't we go ahead and focus on your three main topics, starting on page 18. You know, a lot of our listeners think of your colleague Keith McCullough as probably the most bullish guest that we've had on this program. So even Hedgeye is turning bearish in this environment. The first of your three macro themes for the second quarter is the USA growth cycle perhaps reaching a cyclical peak. Tell us more about it. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. I'm a huge fan of the show. Uh, I guess before we even get started, I just wanted to uh, <laughs> address the hearsay amongst your listeners. Uh, we definitely uh, appreciate the, the kind words, but uh, certainly uh, within the hallways of Hedgeye, Keith's certainly no uh, perma bull. We like to go both ways at Hedgeye in terms of sequencing the cycle, but I would say Keith probably has more of a bearish bias. Sort of when he gets out of bed, we kind of have to cajole him a little bit to, to, to turn bullish. So yeah, fortuitously, we've caught some pretty big up moves. Well, I think that probably the way to describe it is Keith is a very outspoken individual, and the yeah. times that he's been on the show in the past, he has been very adamant in a bullish view, and he's been proven right by the market, so we got to credit him with that. Uh, even Keith McCullough has turned bearish, though, so what's going on with the peak cycle theme that you're focusing on as your number one topic for Q2 of 2018? So your listeners will definitely know that you know what we met, what matters most to us at Hedgeye is sequencing the cycle from a second derivative rate of change perspective, particularly keying off of changes in growth and inflation and and profits uh, as our key drivers for predicting financial market returns over the intermediate term, um, and and certainly just sort of isolating the U.S. model. Uh, what we're our models are picking up on a on a peak in the year-over-year -year rate of change in economic growth uh, here in the U.S. in the first part of 2018. Um, and we definitely see that developing into a, a trend lower in economic growth as we progress throughout the back half of the year. So that's something we think is, is sort of imputing a fair amount of volatility into financial markets and across asset markets. And, and we definitely think that's uh, a, another factor that sort of capped the upside in, in bond yields uh, domestically, which has been obviously counter to consensus positioning and, and obviously some pretty big calls by some pretty big name investors. 
And for any new listeners who are not familiar with Hedgeye's process, which is actually very involved and very interesting, we've discussed that in our prior interviews with Keith McCullough. So if you'd like to hear that information, go back and look for Keith McCullough's picture on our homepage at macrovoices.com and listen to some of those prior interviews where we get into Hedgeye's process in detail. Darius, it looks like as we move into uh, slide 20 or so, you're showing that, uh, boy, we're here and it sure looks like a cyclical peak to me. Talk us through the next few slides here. Yeah, for sure. So uh, again, you're probably going to hear the word sequence from me several times throughout this interview because that's kind of sort of the hallmark to our fundamental process. It really is the hallmark to our entire process, uh, even if you loop in our derivative market analysis that really aims to try to identify where investor consensus might be and might be positioning at the margins. Obviously, with sequence, it matters where you're coming from and where you're going. Um, what we show on slide 20 is that we're coming from a pretty asymmetric point from the perspective of our rate of change, second derivative analysis on when isolating growth as a factor. Uh, so this chart just sort of shows the consecutive quarters of accelerating year-over-year GDP growth in the post, post-war era. And what we learn is that we're at a fairly asymmetric point in terms of how fantastic this sort of run of growth has been off the, the mid-2016 lows. Now, if you flip over to slide 21, we show that same data x-axis here, but what we layer on in this analysis is uh, where, where Realized Vol has been uh, using the S&P 500 as a, as a proxy for risk assets. And we're, we're at a really asymmetric point um, in terms of you know where we might go from here, both from the perspective of, of the cycle potentially peaking and rolling um, in, in rate of change terms, but also from the perspective of financial market volatility, uh, sort of having a, a bearish to bullish phase transition that, that might trend uh, for, for, for quite some time from here. You know, we're just at a, a pretty asymmetric point. And this sort of and this sort of really hits the nail on the head as it relates to, you know, sort of this Goldilocks bias that investors came into the year with. And, and, and obviously that bias sort of shifted to reflation at the margins if you look at the, the CFTC net futures and options positioning across the, the fixed income curves. But both reflation and Goldilocks are counter to fairly material slowdown in growth I mean, and, a, and a fairly material slowdown in inflation relative to expectations as we get further into the back half of 2018. On slide 22, you know, this deck is sort of a condensed version of our quarterly macro theme deck. What we've done here is sort of just take a few of the highlight slides and sort of illustrate the point we're talking about in terms of forecasting a, a peak in, in, the, in the year over year rate of change in economic growth here in the U.S. Uh, what we're showing here on slide 22 is retail sales control group. A lot of these indicators, and, and these are just a handful of indicators, we have a, a myriad of indicators in the broader deck that all sort of look the same. You know, it's sort of yet a fairly demonstrable acceleration that persisted from the middle part of 2016 all the way through the end of, of 2017 or into the early parts of 2018. You've seen some fairly steep decelerations from there, and we would, we would anticipate those decelerations really start to trend, particularly as you, you move into the, the, the middle part and the back part of the year where you really start to face peak base effects on a year-over-year basis. Um, a lot of charts in the macro sort of look the same. If you look at slide 23, luxury goods consumption kind of mirrors the same trend in, in re- that we see in retail sales. Durable goods on slide 24, capital goods on slide 25. A lot of these charts just sort of look like, you know, we're kind of rolling off the top into steepening base effects. So th- that's kind of the sort of hallmark of our fundamental uh, forecasting process is one, sequencing the, the, the sequential momentum in the indicator and then sort of overlaying a comparative base effect model to understand how the, the, the year-over-year growth rates might progress uh, as we progress throughout the year with, you know, minimal changes to, to the momentum. Or, or to, to, you know, we can obviously shock the model with whatever we think might happen. But, you know, this is, you know, just pretty standard econometric analysis. And what it tells you is that you know, growth is going to be a lot slower from here and absent sort of a pickup in sequential momentum uh, in the back half of the year. So that's something we want to call out to investors as a as a causal factor for why we're seeing a, a pretty material pickup in, in volatility here domestically. I see that you've got a couple of inflation slides coming up. I'm particularly interested because we've had radically contrasting views. We've had uh, a guest like Julian Brigden come and, and Hugh Hendry, for that matter, as well, come and tell us they think it's 1965 and that there's a massive inflation coming. And at the same time, Russell Napier just penned an excellent article saying, hey, you know, the U.S. is destroying money supply in the U.S. dollar while other central banks are creating money supply. Has to be deflationary. Forget about inflation. Uh, it's seems like everybody's got radically different views. Where do you guys weigh in on this inflation debate? No disrespect to your, your other guests. Obviously, you guys have a, a myriad of very thoughtful, you know, very experienced and, and you know, just really sharp investors uh, join you guys on a weekly basis. So, you know, I definitely don't want to disrespect their views. I, I think there's a lot of credence to be sort of given to both camps. 
Uh, but the way we think about things at Hedgeye, it's that it's you know it's not 1960, it's not 1970, it's not 2009, it's 2018. And there's some factors, cyclical factors that are hard to sequence. But you know, if you wake up early and do enough work, you can get a pretty good handle on on what's going to happen in inflation uh, now, rather than sort of you know relying on historical corollaries to to sort of get you to some sort of easier you know, it's in state analysis, you know, without sort of having to go through the the wiggles and, and nooks and crannies in between there. Um, and we're really focused on those wiggles and those nooks and crannies because, you know, as we saw in slide 26, you know, if you think about the progression of inflation over the past 12 months, you know, the risk asset or sort of the inflation assets and interest rates have really, really traded concurrently with, with the changes in, in reported inflation. So we think it's really important to sort of be, have a great handle on, on those, those, those near-term changes in reported inflation, obviously keeping in mind, you know, what might happen from a secular perspective. But again, you know, our job at Hedge is to be macro risk managers and sort of not sort of prognosticators and you know people who put these grandiose positions on. You know, we definitely want to help investors manage immediate to intermediate term risk, um, which is you know where a lot of alpha is, is generated. So uh, just thinking about inflation more broadly on slide 27, one of the things we're, we're keen to call out is this, you know, firming of core inflationary pressures domestically. We have some slides in the back of the deck that we can hit on later. Sort of showing our labor market analysis that effectively summarizes our belief that that we we were sort of getting to the point where you might start to see jump conditions higher and, and reported wage inflation here in the U.S. We're not quite there yet, but certainly as we progress throughout the year, certainly by the end of the third quarter and, and the end of the fourth quarter, we'll certainly be there from the perspective of much faster trading rates of wage growth. But you know, even now at the beginning of the year, we're seeing core inflation start to pick up. So you know, we have a hawkish inflationary bias over the next quarter too, but we definitely don't see inflation really moving materially higher from there as base effects steepen. If you look at slide 28, some of the things, some of the cyclical dynamics that are going to impact inflation is sort of confident this wireless price war uh, beginning in March. And then then obviously the lapping the all-time lows in medical inflation and this uh, pretty material downshift in energy inflation that we saw in the middle part of 2017 is something that's going to provide some, some uplift to reported inflation here in, in the United States over the intermediate term. But we wouldn't necessarily be able to camp to to chase that from there, particularly with what's going on abroad in international economies. If you look at Europe or you look at some of these uh, more advanced economies, you know, inflation is just really not where central bankers want it to be. And there's a whole host of structural reasons why that is the case. You know, if we want to talk offline about those or if not, if we want to dig into those. But we're kind of fairly consensus with respect to inflation over the next, you know, three to six months. Uh, but certainly as you get to, you know, the, the, the middle part of the 3Q uh, and, and, and certainly into 4Q 2018, we're definitely well, well below the street on inflation. So to summarize, Darius, it sounds like you think this impending breakout to the upside in inflation that you're showing on slide 27 is very possible, but it's not going to be sustained in your view. You think that by the second half of the year, there will be some serious headwinds to inflation. I guess that makes me wonder how that dovetails into your earnings outlook for the rest of the year. Definitely. So if you think about on slide 29, and what we show in this, this table are the progression of S&P 500 revenue and EPS growth. And then we juxtapose the, the historical progression with consensus estimates for the next four quarters. And what you see is that consensus is kind of out to lunch with these projected Looney Tunes growth rates. Obviously, tax reform is a big factor in there. But, you know, one thing that is also a factor in there that we're calling, we're basically effectively flagging material degree of risk to is this sort of a static to improving operating environment assumption that, that's embedded in both revenue and EPS estimates for the, for the U.S. equity markets? You know, if you think about peak GDP growth rate expectations amongst Bloomberg consensus, you have cycle peak inflation expectations over the next 12 months from Bloomberg consensus. You have tax reform. All these things are sort of dovetailing to create this perfect concoction of, of bullishness, which is, you know, in my opinion, is why many investors view the market you know, sort of cheapening here or, or, or cheaper here, you know, if you think about where next 12 month uh, EPS could be. But, you know, one of the things we're calling risk to, I guess, with this peak U.S. peak cycle view is that you can't assume a static operating environment or, or improving operating environment from, from here. You know, if you look at site 30, you know, you got sales growth, you know, pretty much staying where it is. EPS growth materially diverging from sales growth. I mean, you know, some of this stuff is is, is, is kind of looney tunes in the context of what might be peak in domestic economic growth uh, from a rate of change perspective. You know, if you look back to, you know, when we were bullish, you know, for the last, you know, 12 to 18 months, you know, we had pretty easy comps on a, on a sales and EPS growth perspective. You know, the corporate profit recession that we saw from 2015 to the middle part of 2016, you know, it was very deep and it was very pervasive and it was very easy to comp our way out of that. Well, now, if you look forward over the next 12 months, 
it's going to be increasingly difficult to comp our way out of that. Uh, certainly, if you look at it on a two-year basis back perspective, on slide 31, you know, we're showing just a two-year comp stack, you know, for over the next 12 months. And the is forecasting a, a pretty sharp acceleration in the two-year growth rate on EPS growth. That kind of, you know, obviously tax reform, again, is, is part of that. But what is also part of that, what we show on slide 32, they're assuming peak margins. You know, so for the last 20 years, we've tried to get above this, you know, sort of 14% level on operating margins and, and have just not been able to sustain that. For a variety of reasons, I think there's sort of two key reasons why we're not unlikely to sustain that over the intermediate term. The number one reason is, is wage growth. So on slide 33, this analysis uh, sort of juxtaposes various degrees of tautness in the labor market vis-a-vis wage growth. And what you see is we're nearing, one, the relationship is not linear, and two, we're nearing um, the levels of tautness that should perpetuate a uh, material uptick in domestic wage growth. And then just lastly on slide 34, why does that matter? Because you see sort of you know, at the end of, of every economic cycle, you have this pretty sharp uptick in wage growth towards the end of the cycle that really drags down corporate profit margins. And then once you get to a certain threshold in corporate profit margin degradation, you start to see you know, firings and separations increase. So you know, again, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I think we have to get through the back half of 2018. But uh, certainly as we progress through throughout 2018, you know, you might see a peak in, in the EPS growth rates in here in Q1 and, and, and earnings might actually start to become a liability for the market as we progress throughout the year. Darius, the second of your three major themes for Q2 was a global divergence reiterated, you're calling it. Walk us through this series of slides that starts on page 36. Absolutely. So uh, actually, if you jump ahead to slide 37, Again, so at Hedgeye, we're really big on data sequencing and understanding where we are on the growth and inflation sign curves with respect to every major economy. What we show on this slide is the sequencing every major economy from a Hedgeye GIP model perspective. GIP stands for Growth, Inflation, and Policy. And so, you know, sort of the summary of the slide is that ones and twos are good. Ones and twos mean growth is accelerating, and threes and fours are bad from the perspective of growth. That means growth is decelerating. But even if you pull this chart all the way back to the first part of 2016, what you see is that the world has been in a globally synchronized recovery since then and is transitioning to a, a much more precarious state. Think about so many major economies starting to peak and decelerate from a rate of change perspective. So what this chart just sort of shows what this snapshot looked like from a, from a trending economic data perspective at the year-to-date high global equities. And then obviously with so many indicators you know, trending higher, you flip ahead to slide 38. You look backwards and say, well, well, duh, of course, volatility hit all-time lows. We had a two-year-long globally synchronized recovery. That's precisely the environment we should have saw volatility hit all-time lows, which you show on, on slide 38 across global equities. And if you think about it, you know what's happening now is we're starting to see a fairly emergent deceleration in trends across you know, some of these consumption, manufacturing, PMI, and inflation aggregates. I think that's really bad, and it's certainly from these levels of consensus complacency – could really start to, to sort of impart a, a significant degree of financial market volatility to the extent that these nascent uh, sort of decelerations off of peak growth rates really start to trend as our comparative base effect models suggest they will. Darius, as I look at these last few slides, we're really looking at a number of indicators, data feeds that are giving you prognostications. And boy, as I look further to the right, everything's looking red. How does that line up with what you're actually seeing in markets? So we've seen a pretty material step up in volatility and a pretty material step down in performance. So if you look at slide 40, what we're just showing is all those same global equity markets from a year-to-date performance perspective and from a 90-day realized fall perspective on a year-to-date basis, side by side with or juxtaposing that with what's happened in 2018. And what you're seeing is a lot of red and you know some doubling and tripling of, of volatility, realized fall. Slide 41, you know, we show that realized fall on a 30-year percentile uh, basis. And what you're seeing is we're just we were in, we we're basically at all time lows across realized fall or somewhere near all time lows across realized fall for pretty much most of global equities. You know, so we're we're not coming again going back to that chart on slide 22. We're not coming from a inconsequential point if you think about one this globally synchronized recovery fundamentally, but technically speaking, also all time lows in volatility. So it won't take much to sort of you know reduce risk budgets and, and sort of. You know, force investors to close trades. And so this is something that we, we're really keying on. If you look at global interest rate markets, on slide 42, confirming our outlooks. Uh, so one of our big calls is at Hedgeye is, is, is sort of quad four in the Eurozone, i.e. Europe slowing. We have European growth and inflation 
uh, trending lower throughout the, the year. Maybe not uh, over the intermediate term, but certainly by as you progress to the second, the third, and, and fourth quarters, we're materially below the street for eurozone growth and materially below the street for for eurozone inflation. And that's also one of the reasons why we think if you look at um, economic surprise indices for the eurozone broadly, you know they're down at levels we haven't seen since 2012, and we expect them to stay down and around these levels until consensus sort of gets its act together. Um, in terms of of no longer sort of straight lining what had been a fantastic recovery in years on growth and inflation that that culminated in Q4, it's Q2 here in 2018. So we definitely want investors to be managing the risk that's ahead of them, not not the narratives that that are behind them. A theme that we've heard a lot about from our other guests is the risk if China sees a slowdown or worse yet, a blow up of their massive credit expansion, it could send shockwaves throughout the global economy. I see you've got a sequence of slides here talking about China slowing. Tell us what you see on the horizon here. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I, I guess we don't make grandiose calls from a macro perspective. You know, sort of if you think about any process that's very data driven and very centric on identifying where you might be on on the sign curve for something as, as simple as growth or inflation. Well, I guess it's not simple, but uh, for something that that's as integral as growth and inflation, the last thing you sort of wind up with is you know these sort of big bang risk calls. And in fact, I would say one of the better calls we've we've ever made as a as a firm is sort of taking the other side of the the wand devaluation uh, fears in early 2016. But again, you know, much like Europe and the U.S., China's kind of in the wrong place from the perspective of its sign curve. So what we show on slide 43, the whole world effectively responded to the chibotomy of the Chinese economy and the massive acceleration we've seen, you know, that persisted from, you know, the early part of 2016 all the way through, you know, sort of the early mid part of 2017. On the left chart here, we got a global industrial production on a GDP weighted basis, and then the global corporate profits. And what you see is that everything bottomed on a lag to China and accelerated on a lag to China's acceleration. Why did that happen on slide 44? If you go back, I, I think a lot of investors probably missed this. We, we definitely didn't nail the bottom in this, but I think in hindsight, you know, hindsight being 2020, you can sort of see exactly why that happened. So if you look at the Fed dot plot, Fed turning dovish multiple times in, in, in the latter part of 2015 uh, into the into peak deflation fears in, in the early part of 2016, you know, that sort of alleviated a, a decent amount of the capital outflow pressure that we had seen in the Chinese economy because that, that sort of capped the upside in the dollar from a broad trade rate perspective. So that allowed the PBOC and Beijing to sort of combine fiscal and monetary easing. That was at peak. That was basically the, the biggest easing package that we've seen in, in modern Chinese history. If you sort of combine both the fiscal and monetary impulse, that obviously had a pretty material impact on the Chinese economy, which we show on slide 45. So the red line in, in the chart on the left is really what investors should focus on. So nominal GDP, this is nominal GDP in secondary industries in China. So manufacturing, construction, heavy industry fell to almost 0% by the end of 2015. We would argue that's one of the causal reasons for, for deflation. But again, everything is reflexive. Again, so all that stimulus that uh, Beijing and the PBOC uh, imparted upon the Chinese economy caused that red line to hook up all the way back to 14, 15 percent by the beginning of, of 2017. What's important about that is that we've gone back to levels of investment growth that policymakers in China have previously identified as, as, as a level that creates a tremendous amount of financial instability. So we definitely don't see them responding quickly to any sort of downturn associated with sort of this reverting back to some more normalized mean. You know, we don't expect it to crash because we definitely think Beijing is, is very keen to avoid a uh, 2015 style collapse. Uh, so certainly something that, you know, they've learned their lesson from. But uh, we, we definitely think the impulse of these charts is, is lower, not higher. And a lot of the reflation we've seen over the past couple of years, you know, particularly across emerging markets, has been a, a direct function of this recovery in Chinese demand. We show that on slide 46, uh, just sort of showing uh, Asian export growth. That chart, much like the global industrial production chart and global corporate profit chart, they all sort of mirror this, this progression in the Chinese economy on the lag. Your third and final theme for Q2 of 2018 is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is the U.S. dollar. Sounds like you see it bottoming. That has been my general prejudice. But boy, there's a lot of really smart people who are predicting a dollar collapse here. What do you see on the horizon for the dollar? For sure. So, I mean, it, again, it's all about sequencing. It's where you're coming from and where might you go just based on changes in, in momentum and changes in base effects. You know, kind of think about both the economy and the financial markets uh, that way. So starting on slide 49, the sequence here is that you know, investors are incredibly bullishly positioned on the euro. They're at all-time high from a net length perspective and, and non-commercial futures and options positioning. 
And then if you look at risk reversals, 25 Delta risk reversals, just taking isolating two month contracts as a proxy for general hedging demand. Investors are about as bold up on the euro as they've, they've been in almost 10 years. You know, what you typically see is a, is a, is a deficit here, you know, calls minus puts imply ball points. But, you know, we've been trending at this sort of very, very positively oriented uh, surplus, you know, over the past few months. So, you know, both in positioning terms and also market pricing terms, investors are incredibly positive on the euro. Obviously, you have to get the euro right in order to get the dollar right, you know, given its weight in the, the DXY and on a broad trade weighted basis. Why is that important? Because, again, if you look at slide 51, the number one causal factor, even beyond uh, sort of this widening of, of U.S. fiscal deficits, the deepening of our twin deficit issue, we would argue the number one factor for why we've seen such a pervasive and steep decline in the dollar over the past, you know, sort of year, you know, 12, 12 to 15 months or so has been this globally synchronized recovery. So so going back to that chart we showed previously, this table, uh, just sort of isolating your listeners, um, focus on, on the left side of this chart. You look at all that green there from the perspective of the GIP model signals for all these major economies. You know, we've been accelerating sequentially on a second derivative basis in the global economy for two consecutive years. You know, much like the chart we showed on slide 21, we're in no man's land. Uh, if you want to think about, you know, how positive, you know, the sort of global economic backdrop has been for investing and taking risk in, in risk asset markets. Again, you know, not to get geek out too much on our modeling premise, but, you know, what we're seeing picking up is, is trending decelerations in a lot of core high frequency indicators that, that have predictive value for, for growth and inflation into steepening base effects. You know, the confluence of that, something that should really cause this, this trend of, of this, this global, globally synchronized recovery narrative to sort of run out of steam. Um, and it certainly is regressed to the year. Uh, you're starting to collect a, a series of threes and fours, which are which are bad, which indicate uh, growth is decelerating from a, from a country perspective. So this is definitely something that historically should be very positive for the dollar. On slide 52 and 53, we kind of show the, the culmination of our backtesting data. Uh, so again, we backtest every relevant major fact, macro factor exposure. Uh, every se- equity sector and style factor to uh, vis-a-vis these GIP models and vis-a-vis their own their own uh, geographies. Uh, and what we've learned historically is that a globally synchronized recovery is actually really bad for the dollar. So, i.e., when the world economy is in quad one or quad two, both of those are, are, are growth positive environments, the dollar tends to be one of the worst assets in the world. Well, if you think about where we're transitioning to for the second and third quarter of 2018, and, and, and certainly by the fourth quarter of 2018, we would anticipate that the dollar finds its bottom here in the middle of the 2018 it actually starts to make a series of higher lows into the, the, the back half of the year and, and potentially beyond. And I, I think that's actually a, a pretty material risk that investors obviously aren't positioned for, as, as I highlighted in those, those charts to start the, to start this theme. I noticed that you used the words one final leg higher for the U.S. dollar on slide 55. Is that uh, a prediction that, you know, it's all over for the dollar after that, that this really is the final leg? Or do you just mean a final leg this year? What, what are you referring to there? From a structural perspective, we actually have a, a fairly positive bias on the dollar. If you look at slide 56, actually, you know, what we're showing on slide 56 is uh, sort of the summary of our, our demographic analysis. Uh, what we're showing is uh, on, on the left side is a spread between the, the growth rate of the, the U.S.'s 35 to 54-year-old population. What our demographic analysis has found out is that, you know, if you track that cohort, what that tends to be is the highest income earners and the highest spenders in any given economy and in, in, in advanced economies. So if you track that that cohort as a proxy for potential growth and inflation pressures, what you learn is that as we progress from, you know, 2017, 2018 and into, you know, 2020, 2021, the U.S. is increasingly positively disposed, we're saying it more succinctly, the dollar has increasing tailwinds vis-a-vis these sort of aging European economies that are actually could potentially be in a fairly precarious spot from the perspective of their potential growth and inflation. You know, certainly with central bankers that are that are leaning hawkish in these in, in economies potentially at, at precisely the wrong times. So your view, at least based on the information available today, is that the backdrop is dollar bullish for at least the next five to 10 years to come? If you isolate demographics as a factor, now again, you know, we'd be remiss to isolate any factor on, on the world's reserve currency and on, on a market that you know, trades four and a half trillion dollars in, in daily liquidity. You know, I think there's a myriad of factors that shock currencies. Uh, you know, one of the factors that, in fact, going back to this globally synchronized recovery narrative, uh, we show this in slide 54. You know, one of the things that I think confounded investors and even confounded us at the beginning of 2016-17 was the fact that the dollar wasn't responding to traditional interest rate spread analysis. 
what it had been responding to the entire time is something you guys have discussed at, at great length here in Macro Voices is this sort of alleviation of global dollar funding pressure uh, that we see in euro dollar markets. And as a proxy for that, you know, we're just showing cross currency basis swap spreads sort of trending back towards covered uh, covered interest parity, you know, over the past, you know, 12 to 18 months. And that's something that's been very negative for the dollar because all that means is investors are increasingly comfortable speculating, carry trading, taking risks in the global global economy um, as a function, again, of the globally synchronized recovery. If our global divergences theme is increasingly fortuitous and increasingly prescient, we would expect the deviation from covered interest parity to resume. We expect the global dollar funding pressures to resume, and we'd expect the dollar to start to trend higher from here as a function of that. Darius, you just referenced the traditional macro conventional wisdom that says that as the interest rate that can be realized on treasuries in any country improves over its competition, in this case it would be U.S. Treasury yields are offering a better return than something like German bonds. That's supposed to create an inflow, and that, that for probably the last year or so, that normal effect that should have been dollar bullish was actually seemed to be operating in reverse. What do you guys make of that breakdown in the usual relationship between the currency and interest rate differentials? Again, so you know, we would never isolate any one factor. I think at any given time, you have to have a, a keen eye on all the factors that affect currencies. You know, so obviously, you know, changes in policy expectations, interest rate differentials, you know, sort of the supply and demand for dollars in global capital markets, demographics, all these things, you know, deficits, debts, all these things really, you know, can matter at any given moment. And it's our job as investors to identify what's driving, you know, returns at any given moment and how likely that is to persist. What we've identified in this analysis is that investors are no longer seeking sort of just the traditional you know, carry pickup in, in more in sort of more uh, advanced economy markets. You know, we, what we've learned is that investors are very keen to, to, to go speculate in, in more riskier securities and riskier assets abroad, probably as a function of, of the recovery in, in, in the global growth and domestic growth, and also as a function in having to sort of move further out on the risk curve to take advantage or at least to protect their portfolios from, you know, Fed tightening. You know, at some point, which we highlight on, on site 55, at some point that no longer that all ceases to be the case. So, you know, historically, what we've seen during uh, Fed tightening cycles is the dollar actually tends to trade down during that cycle. I think, you know, for some of the reasons I just identified. But you know, as you get to to the latter parts of the cycle, you know, and you start to see some degradation in the global economic scenario, you start to see some, you know, some some capital calls and whatnot. You start to, you know, the system really starts to reverse on itself. So that that's the number one risk we're calling out is that as you progress throughout 2018 and the globally synchronized recovery is is is, is no longer intact. You could actually start to see sort of sort of reflexive, you know, covering and, and closing of these sort of uh, carry trades that investors have been keen to chase over the past couple of years. Darius, before we close, I want to talk about what you guys do at Hedgeye because, frankly, I think you're kind of unique in the industry. As I understand it, Keith McCullough basically, uh, after his hedge fund that he was working for as a portfolio manager shut down, found himself unable to start his own fund because of a no-compete clause. So he decided to create uh, what is both an institutional research firm, but at the same time, it seems to kind of undertake to teach individual investors how to be pros, how to trade like a hedge fund using a long short strategy and in teaching people things like second derivative of growth which is not something the average retail investor really hears about tell us a little bit more about the vision for what uh, hedge eye is and what products are offered yeah absolutely so to, i guess the number one thing that hedge eye sort of stands for is or at least we as a core value is this, this belief that research should be democratized Across the spectrum, you know, we don't subscribe to the belief that, you know, there's information that, you know, sort of retail investors or, you know, investment advisors should be sort of kept away from or, or we, we don't subscribe to the belief that they can't understand higher level uh, research. Obviously, we have a, a very large and growing institutional research business. And, you know, that's sort of our day job, Keith and I and the rest of the guys on the team. But where we can and where it makes sense, you know, we do like to democratize the conclusions uh, to our institutional research product so that we can, you know, sort of help listeners like, you know, those who subscribe to Macro Voices or, you know, those within our own community, you know, is sort of generate, you know, sort of higher rates of, of return you know, and higher rates of uh, you know, risk adjusted returns, you know, in the financial markets than they otherwise would be, you know, if they sort of 
listen to legacy uh, financial media sources, you know, which in my opinion, you know, don't offer a tremendous amount of value from a risk management perspective. And I know that our friend Dan Holland has asked us to mention that you're running a uh, 10-year anniversary special on some of those products. So tell us, what is Hedgeye Pro and Hedgeye IQ, and uh, what's on offer in terms of the 10-year anniversary special? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the last slide in this deck, you know, is just sort of uh, showing that some of the details behind this 10-year anniversary. You know, we're 10 years old and hopefully to you know, keep going from here. But I guess the difference between Hedgeye IQ and Hedgeye Pro is this. You know, IQ is more sort of it's market essentials, you sort of you know, ETF recommendations, you know, sort of quarterly investment outlook, sort of big bigger picture stuff. Uh, Hedgeye Pro is, is more of a – for anyone who's sort of actively trading uh, risk in financial markets – you know, that sort of includes our, our, our daily strategy piece, you know, the, the sort of famed early look, you know, have access to the Hedge Macro Show where you can sort of watch Keith and I and Ben and Christian rant <laughs> about markets and economies um, and, and also get to access questions you know, about some of our conclusions and obviously includes everything you, you might receive in, in, in Hedge, I, Hedge IQ as well. Uh, so there's, you know, there's various subscription levels. You know, we obviously, you know, want to put together an attractive package for your audience to, to to kick the tires on. I think the one thing, you know, sort of the end with is is the, the difference between sort of what we offer and what a lot of other people offer is is active risk management. I think a lot of people sell trade, you know, sort of the big picture ideas or even these trade ideas where there's no real active risk management. We we effectively a, a hedge fund that doesn't run money. You know, we run our miles, obviously. And, and sometimes get in trouble for that on places like Twitter. But, uh, you know, definitely what we want to do is, is, again, help investors make actively informed investment decisions at every step of the way. And that's something, um, you know, we really we have a passion for it, Hedja. Well, I can't thank you enough for a fantastic interview. As you see here, folks, in the last slide, Hedgeye is offering Macro Voices a special deal. So if you want to take advantage of that, the process is to sign up and then email Hedgeye. Tell them you heard about it on Macro Voices, and they will refund you the uh, appropriate amount, depending on which product that you select. Darius, I can't thank you enough for a fantastic interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. You know, Eric, what a great interview with Darius. When uh, we had Keith McCullough on the show, I thought it was incredibly bold the way he was so super bullish on the markets. But it is a testament to them to the fact that when the data switched, they were very quick to turn their views on the markets. You know, But Eric, I noticed that you skipped a, a, a number of the slides at the start of the deck. What's up with that? Well, Patrick, Darius and I had a chance to talk off the air, and I explained that we don't have time for all of the slides that he sent us, and he was going to take all of the slides at the beginning of the deck out, and I asked them to leave them in, and the reason is we've been through this before with Keith McCullough. I think in Keith's first interview, we talked through Hedge Eye's process, why they focus on the second derivative of price, which is the slope or the angle of change as you look at uh, how price is moving, as well as a number of other aspects of the the whole approach that they teach. And the reason I wanted to leave it in the deck is for the benefit of any new listeners who didn't have the, the handout from, you know, however many months ago that was. If you're interested in their approach, basically what Hedgeye offers to investors, a service that I, I wish existed when I was reinventing myself from retail investor to full-time professional investor, is basically they teach you how to run a hedge fund style portfolio. So they teach you about a long, short strategy, why you want to have long and short positions in your portfolio so that you're hedged against market risk. They teach you about this whole second derivative of growth thing. They teach you about a whole model. So it's it's kind of like uh, Keith McCullough University online. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time in this interview going over all that stuff that we've been over with Keith, but I wanted to leave the slides there. So if you go back and listen to the first interview with Keith, you'll at least have the reference material. Now, Eric, Hedgeye was nice enough to offer all our Macro Voice listeners a $150 discount off of the product. Why don't you tell us a little more about that? 
Yeah, I really appreciate Dan Holland over at Hedge Eye. They've already got a special on their 10-year anniversary sale, and they're giving an extra $150 off the flagship product for our Macro Voices listeners. Basically, what this is, is it's Keith McCullough University online. They're teaching you, uh, Keith is an ex-portfolio manager from a hedge fund. They're basically teaching a, a school on how to do professional-grade investing and trading using the kinds of strategies that hedge funds use, and it's basically training for advanced retail investors. We've had quite a few Macro Voices listeners buy that product after it was offered in our previous interviews with Keith, and we've had some feedback from it. And I just, in the interest of full disclosure, want to share that with our listeners because it's been pretty consistent. People tend to absolutely love what Hedgeye does or they don't. For those who don't, it's always for exactly the same reason, which is there are some pretty strong personalities in the whole delivery. I think uh, Keith is an incredibly successful smart guy, but he's also a very opinionated man, and uh, he's not shy about criticizing others in the industry that he disagrees with and so forth. Some people find that offensive. I personally don't, but I want to let our listeners know that if you're interested in this product, my strong advice is watch the morning show with Keith McCullough and Darius Dale. There is a link in your research roundup email for free access to a rerun of that show. Focus on whether or not the personalities and the style at which this information is delivered suits your personality or not. Because what we've gotten in terms of very consistent feedback is the people who like their style love the product. The people who don't love the product are people who just found that maybe the personalities were a little bit strong. So that's my uh, my inside uh, advice on that. It, it is a, a, a very unique product. I don't think anybody else in the industry is offering exactly what they're offering. Eric, moving on, I wanted to actually now just talk a little bit more about the number of people on the street that are turning more bearish. Now, obviously, Darius was online here talking how uh, Hedgeye and Keith and everyone are starting to turn more bearish on the markets here, but they're not the only ones now. We're continuing to see more and more managers out there starting to talk about a lot of the warning signs. Like, like example, we, we saw that story about Dan Iveson over at PIMCO speaking at the uh, UBS Global Wealth Management Summit in Davos you know, suggesting that they're already becoming more concerned and that they're taking the risk down a notch and basically saying, well, we're not being an alarmist, but we're taking risk off ta the table, right? And then we had the uh, other month, JP Morgan's Daniel Pinto coming out, you know, saying that equities could fall as much as 40% in the next two or three years in this period of rising rates and inflation. It's becoming uh, a growing trend. But yet me and you come on here and we're saying, well, we're looking for a short-term low in the markets. And we're looking for you know the market to rally into the summer and potentially even make higher highs. And what I, I find it interesting to kind of debate, well, you know, there's a tactical trading element to the market versus looking at that bigger trend. And what we're seeing is a lot of people seeing the warning signs that the top of the business cycle is in and the stock market can at some point become more bearish. But it's always important to point out the difference between being tactical about your trading and what uh, these short to intermediate trends could happen versus that bigger picture. Well, Patrick, I think it's all about time horizons. A lot of people are turning longer term uh, bearish, but you know nobody knows what's going to happen in the short term. And I agree with that. I think that it's pretty clear that uh, this business cycle is way long in the tooth. You know, I, I thought the market should have crashed two years ago. Uh, the thing is, as we've discussed many times on the program, a lot of times people think it's over. You know, it's it's not the Lehman moment; it's the Bear Stearns moment. Bear Stearns was a big deal, but we still got to new highs after that. And and I don't know that we're going to see new highs on the S&P, but I am convinced one way or another that we're in a topping process. Is the top already in or are we going to see a resolution to the upside on current events? Certainly, if you had a nice resolution with China, Trump and Xi make friends with each other and the Syria thing gets de-escalated and forgotten about, uh, you could see markets rally dramatically on that. Maybe it takes us to new all-time highs. Uh, you could also see either the geopolitical or the China thing go the wrong direction, and that could exacerbate the sell-off. So I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. What really concerns me in the longer term, thinking about longer time horizons, what really, really concerns me, Patrick, is we've got not just equity managers, but bond managers saying the jig is up. 
And if you look at the amount of institutional capital that is in what is risk parity or risk parity under another name, basically levered bond and equity exposure, if the bonds and stocks start selling off at the same time, nobody is hedged for that. And when they realize oh my gosh, we're not hedged for that. We thought that our bond positions were going to be a natural hedge for our equity positions, and now we see the correlation has broken down. Everything is selling off together. That's where you get potentially an acceleration of selling, and things could get really, really ugly. So I worry about that risk parity unwind potential. You know, Institutions are not going to panic in the same way that retail investors do, where everybody sees a particular level and freaks out and gets scared. And, and does it all at once. But institutions can and have in the past panicked in slow motion in the sense of realizing that they've got to, you know, sell all of the rallies and, uh, and, and try to de-risk as much as they can. And so I think that um, things could get really interesting over the next several years here. The, the thing, as we've said many times before, is although that outlook, I think, is a very high conviction um, as far as I'm concerned, as well as, you know, people... Uh, uh, that are very prominent in the industry, it doesn't mean that we can't see new all-time highs first as part of the topping process before we start to move materially lower. Now, Eric, at the start of the show, we mentioned to all our listeners that we were going to talk about the Hong Kong dollar, and I thought it was really interesting. There's a whole series of stories now coming out, and by no means am I an expert on the subject, but it, it really seems to be really interesting and worthy for us to talk about now, the Hong Kong dollar has been pegged, and uh, and it's a, something that the Hong Kong Monetary Authority tries to keep within a very tight band. And what we can now see is that the Hong Kong dollar is approaching a 30-year low against the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar has been very strong over there. And there's a lot of speculation as to what's been causing all of this, and some people are referring to it and asking the question of whether or not this is a deja vu of when Soros and the Quantum Fund short the pound right before it left the ERM. It was an interesting, just to kind of give reference to our listeners, it was back in 1992 when the British pound was uh, in the ERM and having to actually maintain its currency stability. It's a way of reducing the variability of the currencies in Europe. And Soros bet heavily on that and made like a billion dollars that it was going to fall out of that. And a lot of people are looking at this Hong Kong dollar and saying, is this uh, peg, this range actually sustainable? And some of the speculation out there is that this is because of the carry trade, particularly the rates between LIBOR rates and HIBOR rates. And the HIBOR being the Hong Kong interbank offered rate. And uh, the spread between uh, LIBOR and HIBOR is now slowly approaching almost 1%. It's just widening. And the speculation is now that it's the carry trade and everyone basically you know, borrowing on the short side on the lower interest rate currency and subsequently picking up the carry and going along the higher yielding LIBOR rate. It's an interesting speculation, but what I find weird is, is that you would have thought that that interest rate differential would have mattered in all the currencies. Like, there should be a positive carry against the euro, a positive carry uh, against the yen, a very popular place in the past to have uh, done, done carry trades. And yet we're only really seeing it here in the Hong Kong dollar. Uh, do you have any insights on that? Well, Patrick, that is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. In order to qualify for my residency in Hong Kong, I have a significant investment in uh, Hong Kong, and uh, I was required to keep it for seven years in order to qualify under that program. My seven years is almost up, but I've got a few more months left. And before the vol complex blew up, I got out of the Hang Seng Index Fund and put it into government bonds because I could see that we were in some kind of a uh, risk mode in equity markets. That was a good move. I thought since I'm in government bonds, now I'm safe. You know, my, my investment is safe. I don't have to worry about it. And now we've got the currency peg falling apart. So as you say, Patrick, it's all about the carry trade in terms of what's gotten us here. The reason that the Hong Kong Monetary Authority is having a hard time defending that 7.75 Hong Kong dollar to the US dollar peg 
is because of the carry trade. The thing is, as you said, does it invite an opportunity where probably uh, they have a band that is officially defined, and that probably is a mistake to, to tell the world what your numbers are, because we, we talked to Eric Peters about this. When you advertise a number where everybody knows something is badly wrong if you go past that number. In Hong Kong, 7.75 is the target, and the band is 7.7 to 7.8. So once it goes beyond 7.8, Eight, which we're right on the hairy edge of right now. That's when people say, hey, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority has lost control of its own currency. And there certainly is a big risk that everybody could panic at that point and the selling continues and so forth. That is the setup for the George Soros style break the central bank type of trade. And so I worry about the potential that somebody is maybe getting set up to aggressively try to gun the Hong Kong dollar past 7.8 to the point that the whole market panics and, uh, you know, they make some money and I end up with my money that's stranded in Hong Kong for the next several months worth less in terms of U.S. dollar value. I haven't hedged it yet. Obviously, the the way to do that would be to short Hong Kong dollars myself at the 7.8, just take that versus waiting for hopefully a rebound towards their target of 7.75. So the question is, you know, is somebody going to make a raid on this? And I, I don't know how to analyze that to determine just how much vulnerability there is there. Hong Kong has a lot of Hong Kong dollars to uh, defend their currency with, but guys like George Soros have uh, a lot more. So anything is possible. I was emailing with uh, Jeffrey Snyder, and he was the one who pointed my, uh, the Hong Kong dollar out to me. Obviously, he's looking at this as a point of the stresses being in the euro dollar markets. And it, I find it really interesting that we haven't seen the response in that in places like the Japanese yen. And I really don't know, have an answer to it. And you know, if any of our listeners out there have some insights as to why we're not seeing the same types of stresses we're seeing there imminent in other currencies, I'd love to hear some of the uh, arguments out there. Well, and that's exactly it. You know, the question that I've asked all of our guests recently has been, hey, the usual conventional wisdom macro theory says that when one country's treasury yields are appreciating and becoming substantially more attractive than other countries, it incents a carry trade. Well, why is it that that doesn't seem to be happening out of euros and German bunds and everything, but it is happening out of Hong Kong dollars? The one currency in the world where I personally have some exposure for the next four months or so uh, is the one that is doing the, the macro thing I would expect. The rest of the world is ignoring the fact that interest differentials on U.S. treasuries are so much more attractive than other currencies around the world. It's being ignored universally everywhere on the planet except for the one market that I care about. If anybody knows why that is, I'm all ears. And on that note, please help us promote the program. Do what you can. Send your research roundup emails to your friends and colleagues. And most importantly, register your free account at macrovoices.com because the more registered users we have, the more able Patrick is to negotiate to get the very best feature interview guests. The benefit to you is you'll receive our free research roundup email blast every week, which never contains any advertising or marketing. It's just a compendium of links to all of the coolest free stuff that we could find on the internet each week. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's research roundup. All right. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as the link to the chart book from Darius, as well as all of the links to the sample material that uh, Hedgeye was able to provide for us. There's also a link to an interesting new blog article from Variant Perception. We just heard from Simon White last week. And the head of this blog was that the headwinds for U.S. manufacturing, I thought it was really interesting, the timing of it, because it starts to kind of show supporting evidence to Hedgeye's slowing narrative. You also find a link to a number of stories discussing that Hong Kong dollar weakness that we just discussed. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend or myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening. And we'll see you all next week. Music.
that concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.